Gorge River, which is in the Cascade Forest, South Westland. I was born in Tauranga. I lived in Auckland for 10 years. I lived in Brisbane for 10 years. I traveled the world and ended up at Gorge River. But it took a while before I actually found this part of the world. I was tramping through here about 32 years ago. I fell in love with this area and I decided to live here and I've been living here ever since. I first met Catherine when I'd been living here for about six or seven years. Her and another friend were coming on a tramp up through this area, so we all tramped together. And then a couple of years later, she decided to come and live here. Then we eventually had a family. This place is very isolated. Because I wanted to come and live somewhere like here, it meant that there weren't many people here. I've always been a very social person, went to all my parties and had a good time. I didn't actually come here to get away from people, I came to get away from people telling me how I was supposed to live. There we go. Come for powers. I don't think many people realise what it's like having to live in an isolated area. It's really hard, but it actually helps to sustain you in the end. For me, it's been character building, sticking it out and following your path. My dream was always to have a female companion living here with me and raise a family. Every day I'd just pray that that would happen, you know. Luckily it all worked out. There we go, tea time. <laughs> She's got me shaved and shorn and every other thing, so... It wasn't my plan to live like this, but... Oh, I like it. You certainly need inner strength. Really, you have to learn not to complain too much. <laughs> I did at first, and I think a washing machine would still be pretty high up the list. Silver bit. You learn to be happy with what you got. When I was living here in the early days, I had pretty much no money and just lived off the land. If you wanted to go to a shop, you'd have to travel 70 or 80 miles. You know, I'd carry supplies back from the shop, you know, for a week sometimes. Ah, uh, we can catch yellow-eyed mullet, kawai in the room mouth. And we can catch white bait in the white bait season. And also eels, uh, catch possums or rabbits. And also there's bush tucker as well, like um, super jack shoots and fern tips and seaweeds and things like that. Oh, the first 10 years I lived here on my own, I didn't worry me if I ran out of food. There'd always be something to catch around here. And it wasn't until the kids came along I had to be a lot more serious about it because I didn't want them going hungry. They had their parents 24-7, that, that, that's what we gave them. We gave them our time. That's what's gonna last, because you've given them your time. The first thing I thought when I saw Kristen, when he was just a baby, one day, this guy is gonna go and do his own thing. So I better start getting used to it now, you know? So I grieved for those 17 years, knowing that one day he was gonna do his thing. And same as Robin. He decided to go to Mount Aspiring College in Wanaka for his last year. And he actually just announced to us, and he said, oh, Mum and Dad, I've booked him to Mount Aspiring College. <laughs> I just did it on the internet. I just thought I'd let you know. And I said, oh, yeah, OK. So when Robin decided that, you know, we already knew that she was going to follow Kristen's footsteps. Kristen said to us, I want the internet because I want to be able to communicate with the outside world. And if I go so that you can communicate with me, it is good to be able to communicate definitely with your children. It's also a distraction. You know, it can take up people's whole day just dealing with stuff. In the early days, I didn't communicate with the outside world. But yeah, so there was a whole decade went by where I just got on with my life. I didn't have the radio either. Somebody left an old transistor radio here and I started listening to it. For the last three or four years, we're actually in communication with anyone anywhere in the world. It's a lovely old British fur sewing machine. And Robert rigged it up to one of the kids' bikes from when they were small. I'm going to sew the two together for a cushion cover. To maintain an establishment in the middle of nowhere, it relies on your input the whole time. I do my paintings, I do my carvings, I spend my time possuming. So my time just disappears. 
some people think you, you, I live down here and you don't do anything, but how can you support four people in the middle of nowhere by doing nothing? It just doesn't even make sense. Once I had family, all my time has just been channeled into being productive. It was just typically doing this sort of stuff, you know, making carvings and simple pendants and um, dolphins and stuff. This is my daughter's dolphin. She said, Dad, I want you to make me a dolphin, but I want to find the stone. Made this for her as a gift for her 13th birthday, I think it was. So it was all done by hand that lives here. As time has gone on, I've got solar power. Now I've got eight panels on the roof, and I'm using diamond tools and wheels and stuff and um, get a bit more work done. But um, I used to, you know, always love doing this work. Every six months, I finish a batch of paintings and carvings, and we go to town. I mean, I go away from here. I like I got like an umbilical cord to here. You know, people think they got to go everywhere, see everything, do everything. You can do that when you're young, but as time goes on, then you're better off putting down roots and becoming part of a place. One of the greatest things I've enjoyed in life is actually being connected to an area. You just feel like you're sustained by it, you know, and you become connected with where you live, with the people who are there. You form relationships with your wilderness, your environment, you know, your whole surroundings. So I don't really feel like living anywhere else. I would prefer to spend my days living here or in this area uh, as long as I'm physically capable. I was fostered out for quite a few years and the people that had me were very nice people. They had a wee shop. I joined the railway in 1942 over here. Met a lot of lovely people here. First drink I had in this old hotel was in 1943. We never had much money in those days. If you had sixpence, it would buy you beer. I always had a lot of feeling for the old pub and had a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun in our day. Some of the boys came down to put in a good word for the local vintage. Sort of cheese that goes down real well around here. Any stronger, you'd have to chain it up. The cheese head was a great thing for us. They did three here and that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, that kind of put us on the map. Roy was a great actor, a very gentle old chap. People still come here today to take photos and all sorts of things. And we give them a card with Roy on and myself and that sort of thing. Key experience always came around the back road here and go down to the lake. Some of the drivers wanted to stay here and I built some cabins and that. But uh, yeah, I call them kids. But how you doing kids, all right? Between 18 and 25, well, we have had some old ones. We've had one old girl here, 84. All your cabins have got heaters in them and there's a great big fire going inside to keep you warm. You've got a bit of time on your hands before tea, so get down to the lake or the beach and get some good fresh air into yourselves. Have a bloody good time and enjoy yourself. Thanks for listening to me. You can relate to people of all age, which I think is a, a pretty valuable skill. You know, people love them. Just that not many people who, who do get to interact with someone from that era and of that age, I guess. Whereabouts there? 15. Yeah, straight up that path over there and up the top. Right, thank you. OK. No, they, they think he's just a, a, a nice old fella. Good on you. Yep. Probably over the years he's become one of the most photographed men in New Zealand because uh, everyone likes to get their photo taken with him and stuff. I used to come here as a customer with friends years ago. I come and have an interview with Les and he put me on a month's trial. That was nearly 16 years ago now. Me and him have been great mates. Um, a spade is a spade with Les. A lot of them are scared of him, which is quite funny. But he's, you know, he can be quite stern at times. It's like you play up, be an idiot in my bar, you get out. That's the way it's handled, you know? There's no mucking around. <laughs> I do do me nana at times. 99% of them are great. You can get the odd one, like, you know, but still we didn't straighten them out before they've gone to bed. Well, they have a steak here. They live on noodles while they're away. They do enjoy the meal here. Yeah, well, they come in here dressed up. They have a theme, Batman tonight, last night. I forget what it was. One other night here, one joke come dressed as a bloody tree. Oh, you should have seen the legs. Oh, yeah, they get really on. But still, that's what it's all about. 
and they do have a lot of fun too, and that sort of thing, and good people. The hospital board now send us bags of condoms anyway. They, they come up and get them and that sort of thing. It saves them a couple of dollars. They're like bloody rabbits. We used to go to a dance on a Friday night, but it didn't go on like they did today, because if you did, look out for yourself. We seem to really get on well with them, and uh, I like their company. I think it helps to keep my mind the way it is. Keep it as young as I possibly can. We sort of say to this, why don't you go and have a bit cruise or go and enjoy it? But he loves it. He says, Linda, what would I do? What would I do if I retired? I can't see him retiring. They always say to me, well, this is the best stop we've had, and we want to thank you for having us. I say to myself, I'm bloody glad you're here. <laughs> and that sort of thing. They go from here to the Bushman Centre and had breakfast. I live in the metropolis of Pukikura. Came down the west coast here on holiday. Every spare moment I got, I used to go down hunting, and I thought, this is the life for me. And I've been here for the last 35 years. I set up this business, the Bushman Centre. So we decided to specialise in, in wild food. For years, I'd been uh, trapping possum. Yeah, you know, I'd eaten it in the past, and uh, so we made possum part of our menu. Yeah, possum pies, we've just given them away for a donation. I met Justine back in 1996, when she walked through the, the door as a customer. I see thousands of people come and go. I thought, no, this lady's different. Yeah, she's been, been the most amazing thing that's ever come into my life, so and things are still going good. She makes a mean pie. I decided to get married on the mountain that he's climbed many, many times, and he flies helicopters, so we flew up in a helicopter, and we have sappers on the mountain. All the skins that we skin the possums over the years, we bleach them all, and I patched them all up and made this long possum wedding dress. And it was quite a hit, really. say different things but it, it has a sort of like a, a lamb taste. Some people say it tastes like cat. <laughs> Hokikor is an old sawmill town and not everyone recognises it as a town. The population of the town's five. And we just put the eyes in which gives the air through the pastry and then um, you have a, the possum head on the pie. I've always wanted to fly. Justine was the one that encouraged me into going and getting my licence. Landing somewhere and switching the machine off and knowing there's been nobody else has been in this little spot. You know, if there has very few people, I think it's a hell of a privilege. I'll keep flying as long as I can. Uh, I was born in Wellington, therefore I probably don't fit into the category of being a coaster. People think it's somebody that's been born on the coast, but I know a lot of people that have come into the place and love it the way I do. Couldn't pay me enough to go back to Wellington. I've lived in this area for 35 years. During that time, there's been numerous 1080 drops in this area. I've noticed that the bird life that used to be here is no longer here. We used to have falcons, New Zealand falcons. They used to nest right near our house. I haven't seen a falcon for years. They die from secondary poisoning. I believe 1080 is killing as much of our native bird life as it is the animals that they're targeting. I think a bounty system is a lot better. It gives you an indication of how many animals are being caught. It employs people. So I think they've got to change their ways. We won a uh, national award for the, uh, the best wild food pub in New Zealand with a, a dish we called Chicken of the Forest, which was the back legs of the possum cooked and all the fancy sauces and things that went with it. Throw that in the pot and then boil the crap out of it. And then it just falls off the bone. You know, much as people slag off the West Coast about its climate and its weather and that, the people down here are the best in the country. Of course, the environment's quite harsh at times. You've got to have strong people to live here. And I think when you've got strong people, you've got people with good moral character and, and 
Oh, yeah, just good people. And uh, this is where I'm staying. I was born in Greymouth, but my mum and dad were here in Westport. It's a great place to bring up kids. It's a good family place. Working at the mine, they treat you all the same, male, female, doesn't matter. The boys treat me like one of the boys, and that's how I want to be treated. I'm in a man's world up there. I don't want to be treated any differently. Sweet, I'm happy with it. When they offered the training program, it was like, let's do it. They got the job, got the opportunity to training. That's where I am now. I came from hospitality. And a friend of mine said, why don't I give it a go? My son Blake thought it was great. He just thought it was the bee's knees. Mum's going to be driving a big truck. I've been up here for two and a half years now. It's awesome. Mining is the West Coast. It's life. West Coast is mining. And it's being part of it as a woman is like even better. Nah, this beats hospitality. I'm married to Steve, who's a fisherman. He's been a fisherman all his life. He comes and goes. Usually it's two weeks on, two weeks off. Fishes out of Greymouth. Been married 13 years. When we decided it was time to get a family pet, the kids wanted an animal. So it was deciding what we both liked. The only one we could agree on was a husky. I started growing up, chasing chickens and chasing stock until we actually knew about them and found out what they need. Then it was like, oh, it needs to be run, it needs exercise. Exercise is a big thing. It needs a mate, it needs a friend. Once we got another dog and started knowing other people, that's when we started getting into racing. So it went from one dog, two dogs, three dogs, five dogs. To seven dogs. You want to go for a run? You want to go for a run? They just want your attention. They just want to know that they're loved. Come here, Kato. But yeah, harnessing up and racing them, they need to be exercised. <laughs> when they run, they want to run. It's the actual breed of them that make them run. It's just like they're a wolf in some ways. We had the New Zealand Champs in Christchurch. It's reasonably big. There was something like 120 something entries. Yeah, it's not about winning. It's just the pleasure and the enjoyment of it. It is a family sport. It involves everybody. My kids are at the age now where they want to run them. Steve, he never had a hobby until he had a dog. Good puppies. Let's go. Let's go home. Let's go. Let's go. All our dogs are rehomes. If we didn't take them, they would have been put down. So they actually call us the house of rehomes. This is Blaze, your daddy. She was a rescue home. People get them because they're pretty, and then they don't want them once they start getting into trouble. Yeah, and then they just ditch them. First time breeders, Roxy, she's a good um, runner. So we thought we'll give a, have a go with breeding. And this is her first, first time. It's been fun, it's been really good. Having more, I don't want any more, but probably Steve would have more. Steve bought a trailer that fits 16 dogs in it. But I said to him, don't think you're having 16 dogs just because you can fit 16 dogs in your trailer. What do you do when they get old? You're going to have dogs that don't want to run anymore. You can't just put them down. They're like your children. You've got to have them for the rest of their lives. These puppies are in a week, couple of weeks are ready to go to new homes. Do I want them to go? Am I going to let them go? I have to. But yeah, the dogs are cool. From going to not having them, to having them, couldn't be without you. Yeah, he's doing me. Without the dogs now, nah. How's that, Tethro? Where's? Hey? It's a nice wee place. 
I love the small town where people know you, where they all say hi. I, I've got more and more attached to Reefton. It's lovely. It really is, eh? The horse, to me, is such an amazing animal. They certainly invigorate the human spirit, I think. We used to have the milk cart come along with a big draft horse in it delivering our milk, and as a child, I'd be out there at the gate waiting to give it some grass. Yeah, you know, just the smell of a horse to me is just... So I don't know, it's just something that's inside you. I couldn't, I couldn't not be involved with them. All the memories of that time come back when I start painting images, and it's kind of nice. Yeah, it's just going back in time. instrument about four or five years ago and I love the sound. It's it's really cool. You feel good after you've been playing. That's what I like about it. It feels good inside. In 1974 I became a member of the Ananga Hill Silver Band. Been in it ever since. In the early 1870s the Reefton Auxiliary Band formed and Black's Point Band even before that. And in 1901 they combined to form the, the Ananga Hill Silver Band. I think that's the love of music keeps the band together. I've known all the band members right through my life. I went to school with Lindsay. Is it 45 years for you, Lindsay? No, 51. 51. Alison's the baby of the band. The bonnie baby she is too. <laughs> <laughs> Lou's the oldest member here, and he's been in the band 76 years. Yeah. Haven't missed an Anzac Day. Hasn't missed an Anzac Day except when he was at the war, so... I was in the uh, Grand Staff in the Air Force. I'm the last one left in the reefing. <laughs> that's where, at the wall. Yeah, that's what we're practising for now, really. Anzac Day. Been probably my last. <laughs> no. <laughs> last, yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> I was 13 years of age. I joined the Nangahua Silver Band and I played the euphonium. And I've played all the other instruments. The only instrument I haven't played is a trombone, so I've had to go up the whole lot. We had a total of uh, maybe 28 in the early days. It was great. And it was just like a happy family. But they've all gone. But uh, we still play at different things. Anzac Day, the band plays several hymns at the Cenotaph. Uh, Lindsay, that's my son, he plays the last post there. It brings that special day to everybody in the town and uh, they all enjoy it. Got two sons and two daughters. I taught them to play and the four of them played in the band. I appreciate having them. I'm really pleased I've got them as a family. Get out of it, boys. My older brother was in the band. I got keen when I was uh, nine. I think I had my first contest when I was nine years old. I remember playing that actually in, in Motsuaga. I played, I played the... Just played in the hymn, hymn piece that day. It went quite well. I think we got second. For a small place, we had some pretty good players. We haven't played in the contest for the last, well, probably 15, 20 years. Now. Like I said, there's only five of us left now, but we just haven't had enough players. So I think we're all uh, hoping that, you know, we might get a few more players to come to town, but uh, like I say, the young ones aren't starting now. No, we're young people, there's too many other things for them to do. Like even when I was a young fella, I'd try and skive off and try not to go to bed. And of course, Dad had the screws on me, you know, it's easy to give up, but I'm pleased I didn't. But it's the, the writing's on the wall. We, we can't carry on too much longer. But while we can, we will. Oh, have you been talking to Rhonda? Uh, yeah, she runs this morning. Your dad's still going. So while he's going, I'll keep going. It's been going for uh, all those years in the same hall. It gave service to the whole community. We're still there. We still have a lot of fun playing. Yeah, see you, Dad. Okay. See you next week. I was born in Guadalajara. This time, in the coast, is, I think it's a good life. I mean, I'm 82 and I've enjoyed every bit of it. Yeah, I would, I'd never leave the coast. Yeah, I've sort of done just about everything. There's not much I didn't have a go at. Love shooting, possum hunting, white baiting. The rivers were just tons of white bait. We just caught so much. One season I averaged nine buckets a day for about a fortnight. 
straight out of the river. Beautiful. What bait was our income? We microwaved them once to see what they'd be like. So that we put cruel. them in the paddies and the plate in the microwave. And the poor white bait stood straight up like that. <laughs> a lot of them have. <laughs> they were looking at us. It was they? quite funny, wasn't oh. it? Cruel. That was quite cruel. Yeah. Come down from Greymouth. I worked for your father. That's how I met you. Your father brought you down to clean that batch out, and uh, I come over to borrow a broom. To yeah, you come over to borrow a broom, and I sort of took a fancy to you, and that's how it all started. Mm -hmm. Went from there to there, and yeah. he asked me out to go to the glowworms. Yeah, they're still there, I think, aren't they? Fox, the glowworms. Oh yeah. I worked on the beach down here. That's where I started doing gold. But I'd done gold years ago with my father. I was only a young fella. These are the things that catch the gold. Isn't it funny how he can put that on perfect yet? Can't make a bed. <laughs> yeah, we don't argue, do we? No. <laughs> there's no, not a winner. There's no fun in that. <laughs> you know, we don't argue much at all. No, very little. No. I can take my earphones out. That's what he does. <laughs> He's got selective hearing. Your turn. <laughs> I know, you're doing good. No, yeah. you, your turn now. I've had my turn. <laughs> oh, yeah. Doing this, I'm going to do this in white bait with my dad. I loved it. And I haven't stopped doing it since then. I just loved doing that. I had one fantastic day. I got eight ounces. It's Wait. a wee bit along there, but not much, eh? Let's See go. along here? Along there. Could be your turn. You put some in. <laughs> no, he's got a great nature. He's been a good husband. Pretty strong, pretty tough. Oh, she's got a lot of good points. You know, I won't fault her. You've always been pretty, pretty good. Have I? Yeah. If I run her down, she mightn't cook me tea. <laughs> I think once you're a coaster, always a coaster. It's hard to explain, but it's home. Just out there on the riverbed, watching the little shoals and white bait go up into me net. That would be my perfect day. I think once you've lived here, you don't want to live anywhere else. No, you'd never, you'd never leave the coast. Pocatika on the west coast. I was born in Melbourne to a 14-year-old unwed mother. Went to Sydney to live with grandparents and ended up in King's Cross at about 13. Got to New Zealand by the time I was 19. The coast people are tolerant, caring, and I think that's why a lot of quirky people like me, I guess, end up here, because you can be an individual on the west coast. I don't like bigots, and that's pretty obvious, being who I am or what I am. I knew I was different from a very early age in my, in my case. Everything was illegal back in my day. It was illegal to be, for a male to be dressed as a female and they'd throw you in jail and all the rest of it in Australia. So a whole group of us came to New Zealand um, about 1965, we sort of fled from Sydney and came over here where, where there was no legal ramifications for us. It was illegal to be homosexual, but it wasn't illegal to be what we called ourselves in those days, drag queens. When I had my surgery, it was in the early 70s. The surgeon's name was Mr Hackett, go figure. <laughs> Rotorua, that was his name. <laughs> I love telling people that. <laughs> Ended up on the west coast in 1980. I had a small dairy farm and a partner. And he was a bit older than me, but we'd, we were together for about 20 odd years. And all the local women were spinning and knitting and doing all that crafty country stuff. So I started going along to the spinning groups and things like that. And I, I got quite, quite good at it. And hobbies, when you get out of control with a hobby, you're really out of control. And I bought a wool carding machine. And so then it turned into a shop and, and a museum and, and on and on it's gone. 
I got interested in machine knitting because I couldn't do the hand knitting, I just never got it. And I started knitting sweaters and selling them in a craft shop down in Harry Harry. A lady there, Nolly Martini, she had a strange looking knitting machine, which I brought home with me and I've still got. It turned out to be my first sock machine and I was fascinated with this thing and I got it working. I managed to be able to knit on them. I worked it out from the instruction book. I was absolutely fascinated and goodness knows why. I started collecting them and buying them up around the country and it was quite amazing. I'd pick up machines out of people's sheds. I think I've got around 200 sock machines now. The Boer War, they'd be knitting socks for soldiers in castles in, in Scotland and there'd be 500 women all on one of these hand crank sock machines. That's how they were done. And people's minds boggle when you say, well, the very first machine was made in 1540. Gradually, they got up to the machines that are chain driven and pattern driven and, and I used those in the shop. Old vintage commercial machines. They are really very early computers. You've got the program which is on the chain and the pattern which is on the drum. And they all have to be timed impeccably or they don't work. I was always reasonably mechanical, I guess, and, and anything to do with machinery or I could fix the tractor or the car or any of that crap and got them going. You can make socks in about a minute, a minute and a half per sock, which is really slow on today's industrial standards. Today, they're all enclosed and they'll spit a sock out every few seconds into a basket. That doesn't interest me at all. I like the mechanical part of it. I love it. It's fabulous. I'd been doing up machines for a year or two. And I found there were other people interested in them and I was doing them up and selling them to Americans. And then thought, well, why can't we just make new machines and, and model them on one of the older ones? Seven years ago now, I started making them. Uh, we're now on our fourth or fifth model. I don't know, we must have sold a couple of thousand machines. And we're away. I go to the States once or twice a year and I go to the Circular Sock Knitting Machine Conference. Yeah, there is a conference. The Circular Sock Machine Society of, of America. America. <laughs> People come from all over the world to it. Last year I did 16,000 miles driving around the States, running classes each weekend, workshops and things like that. It's good, it's good fun. 1,600 kilometres of someone reading every single road sign. I out did round. not, only the funny ones had, what was it, 23rd and three quarter street or something. <laughs> I annoy the hell out Give of Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've been friends for donkey's ages. I come in here to torment her. It works. I know. <laughs> we got oil? 16,000 kilometres and a rental car. Stayed at a few crummy motels. And... Selma and Louise here. Yeah. Ina and Minnie. The person that was running the conference was ex <laughs> an, ex an extremely serious type of girl. <laughs> We had a bit of fun at the dinner, didn't we? <laughs> we introduced a bit of levity to it, <laughs> which included her boyfriend, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, and she wasn't <laughs> happy about that. <laughs> oh, no, no, they won't forget Jackie. When I started the shop in Hokitika, it was a bit of a joke at first. How is she ever going to make any money out of just selling socks? but it's absolutely amazing. People get really excited about socks. Yeah, people are really fussy about what socks they wear. And they'll pay $50, $60 for a pair of possum socks and not think twice about it. It's really interesting. Jackie's got a heart of gold. No, I'm not. I'm an arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> She'd give you the shirt off her back if no, she thought you needed it more than her. No, I wouldn't. She'd help anyone out. No, I wouldn't. I don't want my reputation ruined. <laughs> and she can be an absolute bitch. That's better. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm an yeah. arsehole. It's taken me years to perfect it. <laughs> well, you haven't done a very good job. <laughs> How many rows have I done? Living on the West Coast, I think, is a way of life, and I, I think I've been here for 32 years now. I understand it's about 35-year apprenticeship. I, I guess in another three years, I'll declare that I am actually a coaster. Coffee, please. How are you? Good. Even though I wasn't born here, it's the place I feel the most comfortable. A lot of people want to go back to where they were born. 
to me, my rebirth happened on the West Coast, the place that I want to spend the rest of my life at. I ended up in Hokitika six years ago when I accepted a position at Westland High School as a drama teacher. I have a passion for the theatre, musical theatre specifically, but at the same time I also wanted to have a family and be able to spend time with my family. So teaching seemed like a really good way to marry the two things up together. We will actually put the photos inside. Doing the show in Chicago at the moment is a great way for me to do things that I enjoy as part of my job. It's a really important thing that I want to pass on to kids here on the West Coast, to have opportunities to connect with theatre. Hi, my name is Joe, and I work at a fun factory. One day, my boss said to me, he said, Joe. It is a community production. We've evolved. It's also good for the students to see what adults can produce. It is at a slightly higher level, and it's, it's certainly more focused. And the kids um, being able to see that and aspire towards that is a really good thing. Are you busy? I said yes! Some of the students have never done a single thing before. All that jazz, Nicole and Laura. If I can get them doing one thing in their time at school, then that makes me really happy. Honestly, it makes me really upset. You've got less than 24 hours to get it together. This isn't a ballet, this is a musical. When you're on stage, open your goddamn traps and sing. Tom. They have worked bloody hard. It's been probably about 15 weeks of working really, really hard. So I actually got to the point where I was a wee bit worried that they might peak, because, you know, you kind of hit a peak and then people start to get a bit silly or sloppy or whatever. So my fingers are crossed. I'm married to Karen. I'm really lucky to have married a woman who is so supportive and so good to me. It was a baby face. Obviously, the years have not been kind. <laughs> Karen's choreographing the show. She's a, f a fabulous dancer in the first instance, and um, she produces outstanding choreography. Are you good? And Karen will go in and teach them choreography, and then come home and um, I go in and do blocking. Hello, Maddie. Sometimes I sit there and I think, how do we make this work, Karen and I, with three kids, you know, being busy with shows? We kind of pass in the night during the rehearsal process. I've actually got some heat, so I'm going to stop on by and drop them on, on my way to the theatre. I'd like to think that I'm the kind of father that will be there for my kids. Well, should I call past anyway? I want my kids to grow up knowing that their parents are proud of them. Well, do you want them for tonight or do you want them for another night? My mother's never been very good at telling me that she's proud of this or that or whatever else. He doesn't want them for Wednesday now anyway. He wants them for Friday. I keep telling them every time they make me feel proud. <laughs> There are a few days that go by where I don't actually take time to think of how lucky I am. Where are you sitting? I do affectionately refer to my kids at school as my whanau away from my whanau at home. Is Max up at the table? Yes. Brilliant. And that's, that really is how I, how I feel about those kids. They are just like extended family, really. Do you want to drink? I'd be thrilled to see someone achieving at the absolute highest level. Someone standing there on a podium with an Oscar in their hand or whatever. No, don't put peas in your mouth. I'd love to hear them say, you know, and I'd like to thank my drama teacher way back in Hokitika for encouraging me to try. And I, I would quite proudly strut about saying, I knew him or her whenever they were how old and doing whatever. That would that would be a real kicker. Do some more? Come on. First started doing theatre when I was in primary school. Nick is really fun to work with. He's he's a really good director. I like working with him. 
My family's been more than encouraging. My grandma always came and watched my shows. And every opening night, I'd have flowers just sitting by my dresser. She was the president of the Operatic Society in Greymouth. Yeah, um, she passed away uh, in rehearsals uh, about a few weeks ago. And she loved watching me do shows. She'd always be so proud of me when I come off, when I finish the show and I come out. And she's standing there in the crowd and yeah, she always give me a big hug when I finish. I like to tell my kids how proud they make me feel. Kids need it. Despite the fact that I've yelled at you a hundred times, I do it all from a place of love. <laughs> really, what you've brought here makes me really, really proud. All right? <laughs> oh, shush. Shut up, you bastards. <laughs> people are going to get wind of how good you guys are. I put on the shows because I want kids to share my passion for theatre. And I, I probably didn't realise how passionate I was until I got here. I found that kids didn't understand the culture of theatre and that was something I wanted to change. Yeah, I'm afraid so, Roxy. Oh, I'm Sergeant Fogarty, that was the policeman. You know, I just like acting. I would love to go to drama school. And that's my teacher. He's just a real good guy and loves his kids and his family. And, you know, he loves us, his class, so, yeah, he's pretty cool. <laughs> I see. And, you know, and that makes you feel like you want to do acting more. You know, it just gets me happy. And as my parents say, it's good to see me on stage. Other people, I guess, their parents are pretty proud of them too. It's just pretty good all round. It makes me really happy to see kids doing well. Some of them may go through life never having had a cultural experience around theatre in any way whatsoever. And it makes me feel better that um, I've given people a chance to have opportunities to connect with theatre in whatever shape or form that may come be on stage, backstage, you know, lighting, whatever. Um, I would hate to think that um, a child left school here and could have been a great performer but never had the chance. I don't know whether I'd really call this odd ball, but the coast's full of people who are a little bit different and are accepted. Being a good husband, pretty sharp, eh? Hey? Don't know about that. Yeah. I just love being here and I appreciate being here. I'm connected to this place, so that's been a blessing for me. You've got to keep the mind active. Still practice and I still play. A lot of lovely people here and that sort of thing. People here have got a different sort of attitude to life. I'm wrapped with it.